Can you hear me? Great. Okay, so uh, thanks for inviting me to speak today, Matt. Um, as you mentioned, it's a little bit of a different topic than the other talks today, but uh, going to talk about how we um, exploited a bug in the Chrome sandbox uh, to, or in the browser process to escape the Chrome sandbox. So first, a little bit of background on me. Uh, my name is Tim Becker. Uh, my handle online is usually TJ Becker, sometimes with an underscore, as is the case on Twitter. And I'm a security researcher at Theory, who's currently focused on browser exploitation. Um, as you, I guess, could guess based on the title of the talk. Uh, but I'm also an avid CTF player. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with CTFs, they're capture the flag competitions. They're a sort form of hacking competition. It's actually how I got my start in security by playing these competitions in high school. And then I later joined PPP. Um, and I attribute most of what I know about security to playing CTFs. So if you haven't ever tried them, I recommend giving it a shot. Uh, but we're not here to talk about CTFs, we're here to talk about Chrome. So uh, on the agenda for today is first a bit of background about Chrome. So a little bit about the security architecture and uh, the IPC mechanisms in Chrome. And that should be enough to describe uh, the details of the bug and explain how it can be triggered. Um, and then we'll get into the details of how the bug was exploited. Um, and there's a little bit of a different approach that we use than um, typical sandbox escape bugs that have been uh, publicly disclosed. So you might find that interesting. Uh, and then at the end, there will be some higher level takeaways. So if you um, didn't especially care for the uh, nitty gritty details of the exploit, um, hopefully there's still something interesting at the end that you, uh, you might take away. So um, Chrome's philosophy for security is a slightly different than um, the other major browsers. Uh, Chrome doesn't implement a whole lot of exploit mitigation strategies and instead relies much more heavily on um, strong sandboxing. So most of the interesting attack surface on the web, such as uh, DOM rendering or script execution or anything media or graphics related, uh, typically runs in a sandbox process. Um, and in fact, Chrome actually is I think the only major browser implementing site isolation, which is a, a policy that keeps data from distinct origins in separate sandbox processes. Meaning that um, if a user visits a malicious website that compromises their browser or compromises um, one of these sandbox processes, uh, there's not very much that uh, a malicious attacker could do because data from other origins such as Google or Facebook or Twitter should be protected and not accessible from that um, sandbox process. Um, but obviously not all of Chrome can run unsandboxed, otherwise it couldn't really do anything uh, like web related or access the, the file system or anything. So um, there is one central process called the browser process, which runs completely unsandboxed. And this is kind of the main process whenever Chrome is launched. And um, some of the other sandbox processes have um, varying degrees of sandboxing with access to different parts of the system, but uh, this, the browser process is usually the one being targeted um, in a sandbox escape exploit because it's completely unsandboxed. Um, and so this means that if an attacker wants to fully exploit Chrome, it typically requires two or more bugs. So first they have to get code execution within one of the sandbox processes. Um, and that usually requires one or more bugs. And then from there, they have to try to escape the sandbox. And again, this usually requires one or more bugs. And uh, the sandbox escape, especially lately, is usually the bottleneck here because um, you know, Chrome designs their security architecture so that um, you know, even if the sandbox processes get compromised, it's the attacker's ability should still be very limited. And they uh, have pretty strong security boundaries to prevent sandbox escapes. Uh, and so this talk is going to describe um, one bug in the browser process that a compromised uh, renderer process, which is kind of like the one of these processes that is responsible for rendering the DOM and script execution. Uh, can One of these uh, renderer processes can use this bug to get code execution in the browser process and therefore 
escape the sandbox. Okay, uh, a little bit about Chrome IPC. So all of these different sandbox processes are running and they need to communicate with one another. Um, so the primary IPC mechanism used in Chrome is called Mojo. Um, this is kind of a newer mechanism or um, IPC platform. And the legacy IPC platform is kind of entirely phased out, almost entirely phased out. Um, and so it's not going to be relevant for this talk, but I just wanted to mention it for good measure. Uh, Mojo is a platform agnostic implementation of like most of everything you would want to do IPC. And the way that it works is you specify your messages uh, that you want to be able to send across process boundaries in a Mojo IDL format. Um, and then during Chrome compilation, code for each of your target languages that you are going to use uh, in Chrome to communicate over this um, Mojo interface will, will be generated and um, you can link against it in all your various languages. So here's an example of that. Um, this is an example Mojo interface. It's actually the one that we're going to target, but um, I'll describe a little bit more about what its purpose is later. For now, just take away that um, you, you write this interface definition here. It defines one method called filter installed apps. And um, during compilation, some bindings get produced for all the various languages. Uh, for instance, C++, Java, if it's an Android Chrome build, and JavaScript. And these, these various bindings basically implement um, the interface in that corresponding language that if you were to implement this interface, uh, you should provide all of these methods and whatnot. Um, and then it also implements uh, proxy objects. So if, for instance, like if from C++ you want to uh, use an instance of an, an installed app provider um, in a remote process, you would use this proxy object to send and receive uh, messages. So um, if you noticed, one of the target languages um, is JavaScript. And this means that uh, there's actually support for job for uh, speaking over Mojo in JavaScript, and um, there's a, there's a Blink flag, which Blink is kind of like the rendering engine in Chrome uh, for enabling Mojo JS, which allows uh, a web page script running in a web page context to directly talk over Mojo. And so, uh, of course, this feature is not enabled by default um, for security reasons. However, a compromised renderer um, can actually enable this feature without needing to escape the sandbox by just flipping the appropriate bit in memory and then starting a new JavaScript context. Um, what this means for the purposes of writing a sandbox escape exploit is that uh, you can essentially assume Mojo.js is enabled and it's kind of more or less equivalent to um, having a compromised renderer process if you just uh, enable this command line flag. It's not exactly the same because you don't have, you know, read write arbitrary read write access or anything uh, in the renderer with this. But um, most bugs that you're going to target for a sandbox escape just require speaking over Mojo. So, okay, so uh, a little bit more background on Chrome before I can describe the bug. Um, so every frame on a web page, which is you know the main frame or any iframes that are included. Uh, are backed by a render frame host object in the browser process. Um, and this is kind of the main uh, point of communication for each frame uh, over IPC. And many of the Mojo interfaces that a renderer would want to acquire access to to implement any of the web platform features, uh, it'll get a handle to it by asking the render frame host to um, create it for it. And so this code snippet here runs during initial initialization of a new render frame host. And it basically uh, populates a map for all the different interfaces uh, that it can provide. And then it gives a callback to invoke whenever a renderer um, requests that interface. And in this case, um, the callback simply just creates a new um, C++ implementation object implementing this interface and uh, hooks up the, the Mojo handle connection to that implementation. OK, so that should be enough to describe the bug. 
Uh, first, a little bit of background on the bug and its lifetime. So uh, for those that haven't heard, Edge browser is now Chromium based as of January this year. Um, and so the Edge developers are kind of working on a Chromium fork at the moment. Uh, and some of the features they're implementing are getting merged back into Chrome. Um, so this installed app provider interface that I showed you was originally only implemented on Android. And it, it was a feature, it was part of the web platform feature to uh, allow a website basically to um, check if, a, if the, like the corresponding native app is installed on the device. And um, I guess Microsoft wanted a, a similar feature, or I guess the same feature to be implemented um, on Windows in Edge. So it could, a website could check if a native app is installed. Um, and so the Edge team implemented this interface uh, separately in C++. So the Android version was written in Java. Um, and so from a memory safety standpoint, it was probably secure. Um, but this version was written in C++, as is most of desktop Chrome. Um, and as I mentioned, some of these features are getting merged back into Chrome. And so this one actually did. And it landed in Chrome 81, which was uh, released sometime in March, I believe. Um, but it was behind an experimental flag because uh, this is a new experimental feature that they were trying out. And the implementation um, had a, a use after free vulnerability in it. But the interesting thing was that this bug was actually reachable uh, even with the flag disabled because uh, where they actually checked if this feature was enabled was just after uh, the bug was, could be triggered. And so uh, a little bit later, the code was refactored a little bit and the bug still existed, but it happened to be moved behind this experimental flag. But uh, I guess this is a, one an interesting takeaway is that um, because Chrome is, is on this like six week release cycle, uh, the reachable version of the bug was in Chrome 81, which you know it, uh, should live for about six weeks before Chrome 82 comes out. And so this bug would have been exploitable in the wild for about um, six weeks. But we found it and reported it uh, just before Chrome 81 hit stable. So uh, thankfully it was fixed and it never got pushed out to users. Uh, so what actually is the bug? So this installed app provider impl is uh, the C++ implementation of this interface I described. And um, recall that it's created by the render frame host uh, whenever a, a certain frame in a, in a web page requests access to it. And so this object um, actually stores a pointer to this render frame host object. And this is a, a raw pointer. It's not a smart pointer of any kind that is able to detect uh, if this render frame object has been destroyed. And uh, in the implementation of this filter installed apps function that uh, this interface provides, it uses the pointer to uh, look up the, the corresponding render process and check if it's an incognito tab. Um, basically, it's a process level feature whether or not the, um, the web pages being rendered in it are um, incognito or not. And uh, the problem is that this render frame host can be freed from the renderer. Um, so for instance, if the render frame host corresponds to an iframe on the web page, if the web page removes that iframe, it causes the render frame host to be freed. And furthermore, uh, this installed app provider impl um, isn't freed whenever the render frame host is freed. Uh, it actually stays alive as long as the Mojo connection to it is kept open. This means that um, if a web page is able to free this render frame host before calling the filter installed apps, um, this render frame host pointer will be uh, stale and a use after free should occur. Okay, so now I'll describe how we can actually trigger this bug. Um, I alluded to it earlier, but here's the exact procedure. So uh, a web page can create a new render frame host um, by adding an iframe. And then in this iframe, in that corresponding JavaScript context, um, you can use Mojo.js, which uh, can be enabled by this compromise render process to request a handle to this installed app provider. And then we free the render frame host um, from the parent frame uh, by deleting this iframe. 
So the issue uh, that we face whenever we were trying to trigger this bug is that when you delete the iframe, uh, all of the JavaScript objects in that frame's context uh, get deleted. And that includes the uh, Mojo handle. And if you recall, we need to keep the, the Mojo connection open in order for uh, the, the use after free to be triggerable. So um, we found one way to keep this connection open, which is basically to, to take the Mojo handle from the child frame and pass it up to the parent frame. Uh, and there are a few ways to do this, but we used um, one of the Mojo.js features called Mojo Interface Interceptor. Uh, so then it, from the parent frame, we have this Mojo handle now pointing to this installed app provider uh, for a freed subframe. And now we can simply call the filter installed apps method and a use after free should occur. So here's actually what that looks like in JavaScript. So uh, in the parent frame, we run this first function, which triggers the bug. So as I alluded to on the previous slide, um, first we allocate a subframe. And then we set up this Mojo interface interceptor so that uh, we can basically receive the, the Mojo handle that we want from the child frame whenever it uh, has it prepared for us. And then um, whenever we get this handle from the child process, uh, we set up a proxy object to the installed app provider so that we can invoke the appropriate method. Um, and then we free the subframe. And once it's freed, we can invoke the, the method and a use after free should occur. So then the code for the child frame is very simple. Uh, all it needs to do is create a Mojo message pipe to be able to send messages. And then it sends a message to the render frame host requesting access to the installed app provider. And it hooks that up to one end of the Mojo pipe. And with the other end, it sends it to the parent frame, um, which will later be used in the parent frame to set up the proxy object. Okay, so that's how the bug can be triggered. Um, now I'm gonna describe how we exploited it. So whenever you're exploiting a use after free like this, it's often useful to um, replace the freed object with controlled data. Um, and actually in the Chrome browser process, this is relatively easy because um, there's very little allocator hardening, which would prevent like objects of different types from uh, reclaiming the same memory. So it's also really easy to um, control allocations in the browser where you can make an allocation of any size and put any data there um, using the blobs API, which is just kind of a web platform feature that lets you store arbitrary uh, data blobs um, in like a browsing session. And furthermore, the render frame host is a huge object. It's one of the biggest it's like C++ objects in Chrome, which means that this uh, freed pointer is in a very rarely used heap bucket. So unless um, we're like creating another frame or something, it's very unlikely that this, uh, that this freed heap region is going to be reused, reused by anything else. So if we just um, allocate a very large blob of the same size as the render frame host, uh, it's extremely likely that it's going to replace that freed object. And now we have controlled data there. Um, and so as we um, discovered while exploiting this, it's usually just the first blob we allocate um, replaces the render frame host. But uh, for stability, we, we usually you know, do a few more just to be sure. OK, so um, this render frame host object has a bunch of pointers that it expects to have within it. And um, the problem is that with perfect ASLR, uh, there's no valid values that we could put for those pointers that would prevent a crash, let alone do anything useful. Um, but our sandbox escape was targeting Windows, recall, because this is a, a Windows feature. And Windows actually has a pretty significant ASLR weakness um, for uh, the sort of local privilege escalation scenario which is that um, base addresses of images, meaning um, DLLs or executables, is only randomized once per boot. So uh, this means that like, if the same DLL is loaded in multiple binaries on Windows or in, in multiple processes in Windows, uh, it should have the same base address. And conveniently, chrome.dll is a massive 
400 megabyte um, DLL, which is loaded in all of the Chrome processes. And so this means that if we're assuming we have a compromised renderer process, we should be able to acquire this chrome.dll base address, and it should be the same in the browser process. So we actually do know a little bit of the memory layout of the browser process, at least where certain DLLs are loaded. And so if you recall the buggy line of code, uh, it's a virtual function call on this render frame host object. Um, so yeah, it takes the pointer and it calls get process. And um, if you know how virtual function calls work in C++, um, the object has a vtable pointer within it that points to a table of functions um, that, will, that can be invoked uh, if it's a virtual function call. And so if we have some code that we want to uh, jump to and like control flow hijack this get process call, uh, there needs to be a pointer to it at a known address so that we can point the vtable pointer um, to that code pointer. And um, unfortunately, we don't really know the address of any control data. So we can't kind of build arbitrary um, like code pointers at a known address. But the previous slide tells us that we, we do know where chrome.dll is loaded. And all of the uh, virtual function tables in Chrome are stored in this DLL. So this means that we're able to call any virtual function on any object defined in Chrome um, with our controlled render frame host object. Um, so unfortunately, this doesn't seem like it's enough to uh, get arbitrary code execution yet, because um, it's very unlikely that there's just a virtual function in Chrome that we can just sort of redirect this call to uh, that will give us code execution. So we'll have to build some stronger primitives out of this. And typically to do that, we'll want to exploit the bug multiple times uh, or trigger the bug multiple times in different ways to sort of manipulate the Chrome process into doing something more useful. Um, but there's a slight problem with that in this case, which is that um, the result of this virtual function call to get process is used to make another virtual call uh, called get browser context. And then that result is used to make yet another virtual function call. And so if we just point get process at some virtual function, uh, we'd have to make sure that it's returning sort of a process object or some object that you know, meets the constraints that will prevent those future calls from crashing. And um, that is extremely limiting. But fortunately, we found a nice way around this, which was to uh, instead point get process to some virtual function that just returns like the address of a class member or a reference to a class member, which in machine code just takes the, the this pointer and adds a small offset to it um, so that it's returning a pointer into data that we still control because we have this massive blob that has replaced the render frame host. And so get process will or whatever we redirect get process to, we'll return a pointer that still points into our controlled data. And then get browser process is another, or sorry, get browser context is another virtual call. And so we're in the same scenario as we were with get process. And so we can once again do uh, redirect it to this virtual function that returns a small offset ahead. And finally, we have the third virtual call, which we fully control. and now it can return any value. So we truly can redirect this to any virtual call. And um, the process shouldn't crash. And whatever the result of this uh, final virtual call is um, shouldn't affect the stability of the, the Chrome process. So here's a diagram that summarizes everything I've said so far about the exploit. So we have our blob that has replaced the freed render frame host object. And within it, we're putting these vtable pointers um, into the chrome.dll, which is uh, we're able to know the base address of it based on leaking it from the renderer process. So in chrome.dll is all of the code implementing Chrome, as well as uh, the data. And that includes the virtual function tables. So we take our first vtable pointer and we point it at this virtual function, there's many of them, but we choose one that uh, returns a pointer, which is eight bytes ahead of the first one, which is exactly 
one word, one pointer. Um, and so we can repeat the same thing for the second virtual call. And then the third call, we can point at some different view table, which invokes some different target function. And that target function will run whenever we uh, trigger the use after free. So um, now we can start to build more powerful primitives. And uh, we'd like to be able to jump to arbitrary code. Um, that's a, usually a useful exploitation primitive. So to do that, we want to be able to build a, a fake code pointer and put it at a known address. And um, the problem is that most of the data that we can control in the Chrome browser process is in the heap. So to do that, uh, we need to get a heap pointer. And so it's actually really easy to do, given what we have so far. We can just use a target function, which is a virtual function that does some new allocation and stores it into a class member. Because what this will actually do is place that pointer into our blob because our blob has replaced the freed render frame host object. And then because it's a blob, we can ask the browser process at any point in time to send the data back to us because it's blobs is just kind of like a generic data store. And uh, so we can read the blob data back and within it should be the heat pointer of that new allocation. So then from here, there's one sort of common path used to um, escape the sandbox. So now that we have a heap pointer, we can put a, we can spray code pointers into the heap and then point the V table at it and um, have like arbitrary control flow hijack. Um, so one thing that's commonly done is to jump to a stack pivot gadget, which puts the, the stack pointer into um, one of our controlled blobs in the heap. And then you can use return oriented programming to um, execute arbitrary code. Um, but we actually used a slightly different approach that for this bug at least uh, was a lot cleaner and easier to achieve. So what we decided to do instead was disable the sandbox. So remember that we're already assuming that uh, this bug is being used in a chain um, where we can compromise a renderer process at will. And so if we create a renderer process, which is running unsandboxed, then the other part of this bug change is going to execute code outside the sandbox if we can, um, if we can get that to occur. So uh, in order to get Chrome to run unsandboxed, you can pass this command line flag, dash dash no sandbox. And um, this flag is propagated from the, the main browser process to all the child processes. Uh, which implement most of the sandboxing. And so if this flag is passed to a child process, it basically skips um, setting up the, the sandbox. And so if we were able to just kind of append the sandbox flag to the browser process at runtime, uh, it should get propagated to the child process. And then these new renderer processes, which we're able to exploit, uh, will be running outside the sandbox. So. Thankfully, this is actually really easy to do. There's a, a function in Chrome called set command line flags for sandbox type, which takes a command line flag object, which is just kind of a parsed version of the command line string past the Chrome. And it takes a sandbox type, which is just a C++ enum. So, you know, just small integer values. And if we can call this function with the browser processes command line object and pass the appropriate integer for no sandbox, then it will append this switch to the object. Uh, and so then any process that's created will run on sandbox after this point. And uh, one other benefit of this approach, I mean, beyond just the fact that it's, it's a little easier than ROP, is that uh, it's a slightly more platform independent because you know, ROP payloads usually are, um, have to be tuned like to a significant degree to the platform you're trying to exploit. But this approach works kind of the same on all platforms, provided you can get the, the offsets out of the Chrome binary easily. So we think it has some benefits. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, that function that we want to call, uh, we have to control the arguments for it. And also, it's a non-virtual function. So we can't just use our, um, our virtual function sort of gadgets to uh, invoke it. So we want to 
call this function with controlled arguments. And there's actually a convenient object in Chrome, which already does this. It's a, a Chrome callback object. It essentially just stores a function pointer with some, <clears throat> some bound arguments. So there are many, many virtual functions in Chrome, which uh, invoke these callbacks, which are stored. And there's many virtual functions that sort of have uh, this callback object waiting to be called um, whenever this whenever the virtual function runs. And the the approach that we took here is to um, invoke one of these virtual functions and control the function pointer and the arguments for the callback, and uh, basically point it at that command line flag function with the appropriate object and uh, and you know, and uh, that's basically it for the exploit. Um, so, some takeaways are that uh, because Edge is now Chromium based, the Edge developers are working with basically a relatively new code base to them, and so some common pitfalls that might occur in uh, in Chrome programming might be reemerging just simply because it's a it's a newer code base to the developers. Um, and interestingly, some of these bugs will not just affect Edge, but will actually get merged back into Chrome. Uh, another big takeaway is that um, exploiting browser process bugs to escape the sandbox um, can probably be done entirely in JavaScript now. So you likely don't need to write your sandbox escape component in native code uh, and run it in a compromised renderer process. Um, also, an ASLR weakness in Windows is one of the key things that made the single bug exploitable. You know, otherwise we probably would have needed a second bug, which would give us some sort of information leak from the um, browser process. And in fact, Mac OS and iOS both have a similar ASLR weakness. Um, so this bug would have likely been exploitable on Mac OS as well. Uh, however, it seems to me then that Linux and Android have the strongest ASLR when it comes to this local privilege escalation scenario. And so exploiting Chrome boxes or uh, sandbox escapes on Chrome on Android is probably currently the hardest target when it comes to ASLR at least. And uh, for us, disabling the sandbox was a much cleaner and more adaptable approach than um, getting arbitrary code execution in the browser process. So with that, I think I have time for some questions. And um, if you want to see all the details, uh, there's a nice blog post on our website at theory.io. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, definitely the the blog post uh, is uh, nice. is an uh, understatement. Like it was very well written with the nice graphs and uh, it was uh, like the other like good blog posts I see that, that are like that, that good and uh, in terms of like well written and everything is like Project Zero. They also have like some pretty good uh, uh, blog posts. So, uh, but the slides were pretty uh, awesome too. Uh, reminder, well, by you. the way, don't don't uh, forget to send me uh, your slides, or you can make a pull request uh, directly. Um, okay. That's uh, that, that's pretty cool. So, so what did you say? Like Linux and Android, the the strongest. Uh, because you said like Windows had some uh, ASLR like uh, weaknesses and same thing on uh, Mac OS, but not on Linux Android. Uh, yeah, that's right. As far as I'm aware, uh, there, there's no equivalent weakness on Linux and therefore not on Android either. And so um, for this local privilege escalation scenario where you already have code running in one process and you want to um, exploit another process on the same machine, uh Linux and Android seem to be seem to have the strongest ASLR in that scenario. And uh question from uh, Jaziel. Uh I might have missed it, but how long did it take to find the bug? Uh how long did it take to exploit? Yeah, um so finding the bug, um it wasn't it didn't take too long actually because this is a, a variant of previous bugs that had been uh, reported. And so um, using the Chrome code search tool, I was just able to uh, basically look for similar code patterns. And uh, this was one of the results. So I don't know, maybe, probably a few days of understanding um, that bug report and then looking for variants of it. 
was enough to find it. Um, and then writing the exploit uh, took probably about a week or two. Um, I think I took some breaks in between whenever I would hit a, a wall, like the ASLR situation or um, trying to avoid a crash and whatnot. So on and off, I'd say about a week or two. That's uh, that's, that's pretty good actually. And uh, I don't, you didn't mention it, so I don't know if you used it uh, in that scenario, but uh, I would be also interested to hear your thoughts. What do you think about uh, CodeQL? Did you try to make a, a script on a, a, like a query on a CodeQL to uh, find that bug? Did you play with it a bit or like, uh, could that uh, be helpful? I'm just asking because I started to look at it like yesterday. I was like, oh, that's quite cool actually, because you can do like data tenting and all those things. I was like, oh, I've been living yeah. under a rock. Where, where was I uh, when the, this thing was released? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I actually didn't use it to find this bug, but I have since been learning it and am trying to apply that uh, using CodeQL to find other bugs um, with slightly different code patterns. So yeah, it's it's a great thought and I think it's a promising um, technology. Yeah, because I would assume uh, here uh, the, the Chrome sandbox is open source, right? Because I think with CodeQL, we need to uh, recompile something to create like a CodeQL database and all those things. Yep, that's right. Um, there's actually a, a great blog post. Um, I forget the author's name, but uh, he found a few sandbox escapes um, using CodeQL and he actually open sourced uh, the queries he used as well as uh, gave a brief description of how he he built the CodeQL database for Chrome. Uh, it's on GitHub somewhere, so if I can find the link, I'll I'll include it somewhere. Yeah, definitely. And also, like uh, for the GitHub, when you make your pull pull request, there is a, a readme.md. So feel free to add in your reference link uh, uh, to it. Sure. <laughs> Chazel is like, oh, switch at my next uh, question. Uh, but yeah, like uh, I do agree. It's quite uh, it, it's it's quite amazing because. Although you said like that bug, like it took you only, uh, although like I don't think uh, uh, you're like uh, a good benchmark for that, but you say it took you like a few days huh, to, to find it, right? Uh, for that particular variant, yeah. I mean, so yeah. I have been looking for bugs in Chrome for quite a while before that, but, okay, okay, that um, makes sense. you know, learning the code base and getting familiar with it. But that particular bug variant I was I was looking for, yeah, that, that only took a, a few days because it was just a few hundred results in the Chrome code search tool. And uh, how many engines are using uh, Chromium now? So you say like two of you is, is Chrome and uh, Edge. So, but is they're not using it yet? They're planning to? Uh, no, actually, um, they are, right? the latest releases of Edge are Chromium based. And okay. um, as far as I'm aware, this bug was in Edge as well. Okay, got it. Yeah. And uh, 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 yeah, I guess like uh, for Edge, it's a bit more tricky with like uh, uh, applica like Windows Defender, Application Guard, and all those things. Like the sandbox is probably, uh, I mean, uh, I, I guess like you would have to like, uh, well, I guess not everyone is using uh, Windows Application Defender Guard, but uh, mm -hmm. Application Guard. Um, did you did you look at uh, the Edge uh, variant yet, just uh, for fun, or to see, to compare like the exploitation or? Uh, no, actually, I, I haven't tried exploiting it in Edge. Um, I, I haven't looked into Edge too much yet okay. um, as an independent project. I know that um, the the parts of Edge that are built on top of Chromium aren't exactly open source. Uh, the latest I've checked, they're mm. uh, last I checked, like the open source release for it actually just had compiled object files for all the the things that Edge adds to base Chromium. Um, so it's a, it's a little more tedious to uh, research, but I'm planning to look at it in the future. Yeah, like uh, th that would be also like uh, quite interesting because uh, I mean, for application guard, I, I think now it's an option only in enterprise version of Windows. So it's not very like mainstream. So I don't think you would need to like uh, bypass it. But mm -hmm. I think they're expanding the usage to like Microsoft Office now. And I would not be surprised if or you know, like by next year or in two years, it would be like a by default uh, feature to be honest at that point. Uh, yeah. Which would be like uh, quite cool, but then you would need like some uh, <laughs> some like Hyper-V like box you have to escape. Uh, <laughs> that would be like pretty crazy. Um, yeah. uh, cool. Uh, 
do we have any more questions from the chat i uh, well don't think so uh well uh, thanks for uh, for your time uh, team and for like uh, joining us uh to tonight i guess this morning yeah, you're, you're in texas right uh no i'm actually in wisconsin but same time okay zone. okay yeah, yeah yeah cool well it was very interesting uh i'm definitely gonna rewatch it uh that uh that's that was pretty cool uh, thanks yeah, again thank team thanks for inviting me Hi guys, so that's it. We're approaching. Well, we're not even approaching. This is uh, this is the end, you know. Like uh, Jaziel, you missed uh, all the opportunities uh, to ask uh, more like uh, interesting questions. Um, but although, like, we can uh, still continue uh, to discuss uh, it on the Discord after. Uh, and if you guys haven't joined, uh, definitely join the Discord. So you can uh, watch uh, Jaziel's uh, progress with uh, CodeQL and uh, <laughs> get the, the daily report. And uh, I, I said it, but you know, like, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, it's easier to get notifications, so I don't need to send like uh, to send emails. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have any feedback for today's edition, do not hesitate. Like you can send me a DM on Twitter or just like a message on discord and uh yeah th thanks for for watching i hope you enjoyed it so the presentation uh, slides should be up uh, either like tonight uh right after uh, this or tomorrow so they're gonna be uh, on github the link is in the description of uh this uh, stream so if you just check the uh, uh youtube description you're gonna see like the uh, uh description uh, if you want to watch the previous edition of, uh, well, Upcode uh, live stream, uh, they are on YouTube also, so that's uh, that's quite uh, also convenient. And usually we uh, also tweak, you know, when we have some uh, live issues where like there's too much noise in the background or if there is like some uh, any technical issues, like we fix it uh, uh, after and we upload like a cleaner version uh, on YouTube. Uh, but today, like, uh, I don't know, uh, luckily we did not have any issues and as usual, you know, like, uh, because it's live and, uh, like, uh, you know, Dragos was asking me, like, uh, if I was like, uh, alone, yes, uh, I'm doing that, uh, alone here. Uh, so whenever there is no issue, I'm, uh, quite, uh, content with that. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, and every time it's uh, still a bit, uh, uh stressful. Uh, but yeah, feedback, feedback is welcome if you have any recommendation suggestion if there is any glue, a good blog post that you have seen um, because the format and I think it's gonna stay like this for a while because that's already the fifth edition you know one edition every two weeks uh, same thing you know like three four like uh, talks you know uh, or an average of uh, 30 minutes uh, for each of them and uh yeah that's pretty much it so if you see even any good blog post or even if you do have because i know a lot of uh the the people watching are, are usually uh quite uh quite technical too if you have a good blog post that you want to talk about uh definitely uh let me know uh it does not need to be exclusive as long as it's uh, very interesting and uh there's so many like content uh online to read now uh, that it's pretty hard to track so my uh, my reading schedule now is basically to invite people to discuss about uh, whatever stuff they they wrote about, so I can learn at the same time, rather than just trying to uh, go like straight into reading it and getting all the the details. You know, uh, so far that's pretty much uh, how I'm managing my uh, reading list. And uh, as an audience, I also encourage you to do uh, the same thing. So if there's uh, cool stuff that you have seen. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, share the link and uh, if there's like themes uh, you want to talk about uh, definitely uh, so we have few presentations uh, for the next edition but the CFP is always open if you just go on the website anyone can uh, submit and uh, yeah so thanks again everyone and have a nice evening or a nice day uh, wherever you're from thank you Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you.